Okay, my clock has struck noon. Uh, I'm going to get started because I, I, I know we have a lot of ground to cover today and I have a few minutes of introductory comments to make so we can let um, any more attendees join uh, as we get started. So hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here today and joining us for this online information session about the Comox Valley Sewer Conveyance Project um, for Lazo area residents. We're um, going to get started with the updates that you've all joined to here in just a moment, but first I just want to cover off a couple of housekeeping items before we dive in. My name is Colleen Dane, I'm with Zinc Strategies, and my role today is to help this session move smoothly through the presentation and to help facilitate the question and answer session um, in the second half of our hour. Helping me on the technical side today is my colleague, Emily Kendi, um, giving me a wave, great. Our goal today for this session is to provide you with an update on planning for the Comox Valley Sewer Conveyance Project and to share answers and some additional information um, about questions that have been shared in previous updates um, with your community. Our presenter today will be Russell Dyson, the Chief Administrative Officer for the CBRD. Um, and we also have Mark Rutten, the General Manager of Engineering Services for the CBRD, Chris LaRose, the Senior Manager of Water Wastewater Services, and Zoe Berkey, Project Engineer for Water Wastewater Capital Projects for the CBRD. So thank you everybody for being on to help answer your quest our questions today. We're also thankful for a number, number of panelists and experts that uh, we've asked to join to help address any technical questions that come up along the way. So we definitely um, have the expertise on deck here to cover any questions that you have. So please feel free to ask um, anything that's on your mind. We expect the presentation will take about 20 minutes uh, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, in our webinar format that we're using today, uh, you can share questions by opening up the Q&A window you can find that little icon in the black bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so once you open that up, you can type in a question and post it for us to see. And that's how we will be able to um, post them to our panel today. You can make your question anonymous by clicking the um, checkbox beside it uh, before posting. And if someone has posted a question that you uh, think is important, you can upvote it by clicking the little thumbs up beside it or below it, sorry. And that helps um, raise it and let us know that it's an, um, a popular question for the topic today. We're hoping to get to every question today, but should we run out of time, we will follow up with responses to any outstanding questions in the coming few days. And then finally, if you are phoning in today and would like to ask a question, you can hit star nine to um, raise your hand uh, from our side. And then we will call on you using the last four digits of your phone number when uh, your time, uh, your turn has come for sharing your question. This session is being recorded today. It'll be posted to the CBRD's website for other people to be able to watch um, at a later time or for you to be able to revisit um, if you have any for, wanted to review any of the information and we expect that it'll be posted by early next week. If you're having any technical hiccups, please um, reach out to Emily using the chat function. So that's another um, one of the icons down in the bottom black bar um, that you can just post your question in there and we will do our best to help troubleshoot from a distance. So uh, with that, I think we're ready to get rolling. Um, thanks again for joining us for uh, your lunch hour today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Russell Dyson. Over to you, Russell. Thank you very much, Colleen, and welcome everybody. And thank you for your time today. First, I would like to acknowledge this meeting is being hosted virtually on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. The traditional keepers of the land the CVRD appreciates the support of Chief and Council, the Comox First Nations community, and their staff who help, help us to better steward the land and resources of the Comox Valley. My name is Russell Dyson, and I am the Chief Administrative Officer of the Comox Valley Regional District. It's my pleasure to go through this presentation with you, and then for our staff to be able to answer your questions. We're grateful for the time you've taken, and glad to be back speaking with you again following our update last spring. It has taken longer than first expected, but we've covered quite a bit of ground since then. And there are a number of updates we would like to share with you about the project in Lazo Hill specifically, including how we have addressed the feedback we heard from the community. That includes you. When we last spoke, the project was preparing to go to an alternative approval process for funding the project. This approval was given, the, in, given in the summer of 2021. And since then, there's been significant planning and assessment work underway. 
Before I dive into the bulk of the presentation, I want to thank you for remaining actively engaged in this project and fair, for sharing your feedback. Our planning and design work have considered this input and by understanding the issues that are important to you, we can make sure that we are providing you with the relevant information as the project progresses. I'm very grateful for the CVRD staff team and our consultants and their dedication to the project. We have many issues to consider and everyone is pushing for the best possible solution, that which is effective, long-term, fiscally responsible and addresses the concerns of the neighborhood the project crosses. In the past four years, the Sewage Commission has directed staff to get it right. This has resulted in advancements in odor improvements to our treatment facility and other important decisions. We look forward to taking your questions at the end of the presentation, and I encourage you to please use the uh, question and answer function to present those to us. We, we regret there is not an in-person meeting, and it was fully our intention of providing that opportunity to, to you. We certainly would rather be meeting with you one-on-one, -on -one, but unfortunately, the present circumstances do not allow for that, and we're accommodating this with two webinars. So please be patient with this process. Please make the most of this opportunity, and again, give us your feedback and questions. I have about 12 slides to walk you through with today. It will provide updates since our last meeting, further information about drilling, the processes and the materials, and details about groundwater protection policy, which have been developed in response to concerns raised by this group. I'll just go to share my screen and provide that presentation to you. Great, thank you, Russell. I just wanna jump in and maybe add for those who maybe saw those two additional dates as you mentioned, or sorry, the two dates for this session as you mentioned. So there will be another one of these webinars held tomorrow um, evening at five o'clock. It will cover the same presentation that you're sharing now, um, but if anybody wants to relay that information to neighbors or others who might be interested, uh, we'd be happy to see them tomorrow. Thank you, Colleen. And uh, you can see the screen and my voice is still good. Looks like it's running great, Russell. Great, thank you very much. First, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or who just uh, need a bit of a refresher on the project, we'll start off with a little background about the entire sewer conveyance project. The project was conceived as part of a liquid waste management plan process, a formal process following provincial standards that includes extensive public consultation to develop a long-term plan for the sewer service, including not only conveyance, but treatment and reuse of materials. The plan will replace the pipes and upgrade the pump stations that move more than 14,000 cubic meters of raw sewage each day to the sewage treatment plant on Brent Road. The sewage from municipal residents, as well as the schools, the hospital, and the commercial outlets we all rely on. Infrastructure replacement is not unusual, as similar works of aging infrastructure are being undertaken across North America. In our case, this conveyance project is urgently needed to protect the beaches and waters throughout the Comox estuary, Point Homes, Goose Pit, and Bain Sound. The new system will route sewer pipes further inland where they will no longer be vulnerable to storm damage by waves, rocks, and logs. Construction is expected to begin in the spring of 2023 with completion in fall 2024. Through though some pre-digging for the work through the stretch on IR number one may begin this year. That process will ensure that preservation of archeological sensitive areas is foremost. The project is built on three years of en engagement and public planning. There's quite a bit of detail in this slide, but I, I wanted to highlight just a few of the pieces. And remember, this presentation will be available online where you may review these slides in more detail at your convenience or those of your neighbors who are unable to attend. We started the liquid waste management planning process with public engagement and touch points at four different stages. First, defining the values, then looking at a long list of alternatives for all the components, as well as a short list narrowing the options, and then the alternative approval process, which was required for the borrowing for the project. In 2020, we started hosting these information sessions specifically for Lazo area residents, recognizing that there are concerns and questions unique to this area. We've now held three online sessions, which are all documented on our website to refer back to. We are nearing the final decision on the project scope. This is the project laid out with all of its details, including the final route. The project scope incorporates additional assessment and work undertaken the CV, by the CVRD 
and is all in response to the funding and, and within the funding approval. And it is basically the project scope is the more concrete roadmap for moving forward. Our recent work has led to a few updates to our project route since the last community update. And here we can see the current route map. If you can see my cursor, I'm going to describe the project and its various components, about seven of them, starting at the Courtney pump station on the left of the screen or to the west. Courtney pump station is proposed to be replaced. It will be built further away from the river. This is to provide protection against rising sea levels and meet modern seismic standards. And it should be noted the entire conveyance project will be better suited to withstand earthquakes than the current works. Along Comox Road, we have moved the route further inland in order to avoid areas of archaeological significance for the Comox First Nations. We continue to work with them in partnership on this planning work to be sure that we get it right. Not only will this work avoid archaeological significant areas, but perhaps reduce the impact on traffic as the work is constructed. In the KFN's community, Comox First Nations community of IR1, we will complete a pre-dig of the route to better manage any archeological findings. This is a particular sensitive area. Further, the pump station here will reroute sewage back to the Courtney pump station and be an improvement for that infrastructure. As I move my cursor, I'm looking at Comox Hill. Through Comox Hill, the conveyance pipe will be laid doing, using traditional trenching methods, cut and cover it's sometimes referred to. Previously, we were looking at tunneling this portion or drilling it. However, technical assessment and cost-benefit analysis has indicated that trenching is now the best choice here. Bear in mind that Comox Hill is much lower in elevation than Lazo Hill, so cut and cover is a better option for this particular area. Throughout the town of Comox, the installation of works is very challenging and complex. We will weave the pipe through existing utilities while attempting to minimize disturbance to the surface and, menacing, and, and minimizing disruption to residents, businesses, and the commuters. We are very grateful for the town staff and, and city count or town council that are working with us to finalize these details. A portion of the route between Rodello Street and Stewart Avenue has now been moved from from Comox Avenue to Beaufort Avenue, again, responding to area concerns. Also, the work within the town of Comox will require a major upgrade to the Jane, Jane Place pump station. I now move to the Lazo Hill area, and you can see the orange that we are now zeroing in on the route for the tunneling option through Lazo Hill. I will go through that in other slides upcoming that will go into more detail and provide you a little bit more precision as to that route. But one other comment on this map is I'd just like to comment that what we're doing through the area of Lazo Marsh is looking at options that will not drill through under the marsh, which would uh, be an imposition to the groundwater in that area, but do an alternative route that would be overland. That is under current assessment. My focus will now be on the Lazo neighborhood portion of the project. We've appreciated the time the community has taken over the past few years to join these sessions and share the questions and concerns. We've heard consistently about some key themes. Groundwater protection, concern about the quality and quantity of groundwater being negatively impacted by the installation of the sewer pipe. Aquifer protection, the potential risk to the aquifer, individual wells in the natural environment in the extremely unlikely event of a leak risk protection. There have been many questions to the CVRD about what we can do to protect against risk in the first place, specifically around what technology will be used, including an early detection system and materials to prevent any possible pipe leak. Property impacts. You've been concerned about how this project would impact your individual property, and that is totally understandable. We've done our utmost to address your concerns. We've heard concerns about the impact of a right-of-way should one be needed, particularly in the event of the repair, as well as neighborhood impacts during construction and long-term impact to property values. I want to make it clear here that these points have all been considered in developing our plans, all of our planning work since we last spoke to you. I believe the route we are proceeding with is the best alternative to address these concerns. Pardon me. So on that route, 
What have we done since the last update? The answer is a lot of technical planning that is reliant on engineering, hydrogeological, and geotechnical experts. We have retained experts in all relevant aspects of the engineering, horizontal directional drilling, and groundwater, who have been working to develop and assess the various options. We have completed a detailed review of the system hydraulics to design a lower risk, non-pressurized gravity flow pipe for the Lazo Hill area. We've included the use of resilient high density polyethylene material for the pipe. We have continued review and coordination with groundwater experts, GW Solutions, to verify there is no impact to the aquifer. And those professionals are here today to answer your questions. We have refined our route map to avoid wells, limit the number of right of way on properties and reduce pipe layout impacts. And we have completed further geotechnical testing to determine a safe pipe route. You may have witnessed this particular machine that undertook much of that work here in the photo. All of these steps speak to addressing the concerns that have been raised about groundwater and aquifer protection, protecting against environmental risks and reducing impacts on properties in the area. This series of graphics shows a step-by-step -step process to describe how the drilling will occur as this tunnel pipe is constructed. In illustration number one, starting at the entry where the equipment is set up, a drill creates the first path for the new sewer pipe. This is a narrow tunnel that establishes the route from start to the exit point under Lazo Hill. In illustration number two, at the exit hole, a reamer is then pulled back through the initial hole to widen the tunnel. At this time, a bentonite slurry is added to keep the hole stable. And then in illustration number three, the assembly pipe is then pulled back through the tunnel that has been created. The bentonite acts as a lubricant and continues to stabilize the hole. The bentonite that is removed from the hole in this process is collected and removed in a safe manner. Zooming in now on the Lazo Hill alignment, which we know is the most interesting point probably for you on this call. You'll see on this map the proposed route and how it avoids the wells in the area. This alignment has been selected for a number of reasons. So the blue line is the proposed route. The red X's are wells within the area. The path offers a minimum of 20 meter offset from all deep groundwater wells, a distance recommended by GW Solutions. It offers a minimum curve or deflection and a shorter route with less distance to have to drill through. This reduces the potential challenges in the drilling process. The straighter the line, the better for the, for the, um, uh, the, better for the installation. However, some deflection is possible and we've utilized that deflection in order to avoid wells and again, provide the most minimal impact that we can possibly provide to the surface. The shorter route provides the opportunity to switch from steel to HDPE pipe, eliminating corrosion risks. HDPE, pardon me, HDPE pipe is better suited for these conditions. This route impacts fewer private properties. It reduces neighborhood disruption caused by pipe laydown, and it also aligns with the plan to eliminate tunneling before, below Lazo Marsh. Engineering decisions about the method and the materials for the new system provide additional protection for the environment. Two key decisions include the flow of the pipe and the pipe materials. This schematic diagram shows the surface of the land in brown with Willazo Hill, the tunneled pipe coming from the town of Comox, tunneled under the Lazo Hill and continuing to the treatment plant, and schematically the aquifer that lies below. The line through Lazo Hill will be gravity fed, and this is important. A gravity fed line means the pipe is not under pressure through the section. This technology virtually eliminates what was already a very low risk of a leak because there's no pressure on the inside of the pipe. The gravity slope allows the route to remain 10 meters above the aquifer, further protecting the water source. And because the pipe has to be strong enough to withstand the stress of its installation, the pipe's strength 
far exceeds what is required at a zero pressure operational flow. The pipe material I referred to as HTPE, high density polyethylene. The shorter route that I have talked about allows us to use this material. And it is preferable because it is more resistant to corrosion than steel. It is more flexible and better suited to withstand seismic activity. The pipe sections are fused to eliminate all joints, which can be a high risk for leakage. And finally, it is more res resistant to internal abrasion and has no external coating that could be damaged. All of these factors continue to speak to the concerns we have heard from the community about the protection of groundwater, the risk to the aquifer, and the need for proper protection. There are two main ways that this work will impact Lazo area properties and residents. I'll speak to them. First, right-of-way access. There will be 15 properties in total located both within the town of Comox and electoral area B, which will need right-of-way access for the pipe to lay underneath. Our land agents have reached out to those 15 property owners. There are also approximately three properties where no right-of-way is required, but we will need to undertake some survey work in which the agents will contact those individuals. At this time, if you have not heard from our land agents, that means your property is not impacted and no discussion is required with respect to our land agents. We've reached out to those owners. If, and again, if you've not heard, you won't be one of those, but we are working through the issues and questions that those 15 property owners have. Our land agents are Jim Riches and Len Haley, and they will undertake those discussions with the property owners directly. The CVRT staff are supporting the land agents with background and technical information so that we can be sure that we can respond to the questions of the landowners so they are most informed about the project and what it entails. Then I wish to speak to the lay down area as outlined here in blue. The pipe needs to be assembled and laid down above ground before it is being pulled through an underground. This is the approximate route that is proposed for the lay down. With this proposed route determined, the pipe will be laid down through Lazo Marsh, across the CVRD's sewage treatment plant property, and along Brent Road. This is a short-term disruption. This route offers the least amount of impact on traffic possible and reduces the number of property owners who will be disrupted by the laydown itself. Here are some of the photos to help illustrate the description of work and the impacts that might be seen. These are from other projects that have been undertaken in other communities. The image on the far right shows the level of activity and the type of equipment that would be typically present at the entry pit location during the pipes installation, including the drilling rig, the driver's cab, and other areas for tool storage. The photo at the top left shows the typical level of disruptions on the street where the pipe would be laid down. You can see here a pipe and look at the thickness of this pipe. That's the nature of the HDPE that's used in this, a very, very thick pipe. You can see here the equipment that's used to fuse the pipe together to ensure that there's a clean connection and the fusing is as good as the quality and integrity of the pipe itself. And then finally, how the pipe will be lifted and with small cranes before it is pulled into place. Please note in this picture, the typical thickness of the pipe, as I mentioned. Our engineers can offer more details about these processes during the question and answer. I am now near the end of my presentation and have just two important slides to present to you. Along with addressing the concerns raised by you and the design work completed to date, we also saw the opportunity to offer additional confidence to the community by developing a groundwater protection policy. This document will secure the commitments made here and ensure they are upheld in the future, regardless of changes to staff and elected officials. That draft policy will be made available on our website after this meeting. It is expected to go before the Sewage Commission for their ratification February 15th. The groundwater protection policy has a number of commitments, including the establishment of a monitoring program, a commitment to design and build a well-engineered pipe that will not leak and can withstand seismic activities, commitment to test for leaks using acoustic detection, and in the minute chance of a leak, and I must emphasize that we are committed to building a highly engineered pipe that will not leak, the repair will be completed as quickly as possible. 
Again, in the exceedingly rare chance of a leak that contaminates a well, all reasonable assistance will be offered to provide the property owner a clean, safe drinking water supply without disruption. This will be the Sewage Commission and the Comox Valley Regional District's commitment to you. And finally, the, the timeline moving forward. Along with a more complete plan comes a more complete timeline for the steps forward in 2022. It will be a very busy year with preparation, including a general public update on the liquid waste management plan and the conveyance project scope, as well as the engagement on construction planning. Construction is estimated to start in the spring of 2023 and complete in the fall of 2024. As I mentioned previously, some pre-digging work along IR number one may commence in 2022. We look forward to keeping you informed moving forward. We encourage you to continue to engage with us throughout the project. Thank you for your time. And with that, we'll pass it on to Colleen, who will facilitate the question period. Again, I really encourage you to ask your questions and, and, and listen to our answers. And again, to refer these presentations to your friends and, and neighbours, those that may not have had a chance once we get them up on the website. We look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you, Russell, for that overview and all that information. I know it probably um, addresses a number of the questions people uh, arrived with. I do see a few questions that have popped into the Q&A window uh, through the presentation, and I'm just going to remind people that if you would have a question you'd like to ask, you can open up the Q&A window uh, by clicking on the little icon in the bottom black bar of your Zoom screen and typing in your question there. If you click um, to check the little checkbox beside it, you can post your question anonymously. And if you see a question that you think is important and uh, you know maybe, maybe is your question also, you can upvote it by clicking the little thumbs up underneath the question that helps us understand um, questions that are particularly popular. We also had a few questions that were submitted in writing in advance, so I'm going to kind of sprinkle those through as we work through uh, the questions that have been uh, shared so far. So uh, a few technical questions off the top. Um, so Chris, I think that you're going to be our person for the first few. Um, and so we'll start at the top of the list, which is, uh, what is the depth of the pipe um, east of Lazo Road? Sure. Th thanks, Colleen. And um... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the, the, the depth of the pipe varies. If you could just put your mind back to that uh, graphic that Russell presented showing the um, kind of illustrating this shift from pressure to gravity flow through Lazo Hill. And just picture how the, 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 uh, the height of land rises above the pipe and falls to either side. So east of Lazo Road encompasses everything from you know, the depth at, at Lazo Road, which, which um, I assume you mean the section um, that runs north and south. So probably at you know approximately 20 to 25 meters depth there, and then rising to just below the surface at the east end of the tunnel uh, on the Barron Road unopened road right of way. Uh, so the minimum depth um, minimum depth below the surface would be you know that which we then carry on with the cut and cover section, which would be on the order of two meters down to the top of the pipe. And another question is, is there a risk to wells from the drilling fluid during installation of the pipe? Sure, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start the answer to that and, and then I'll pass you over to one of our expert advisors on the phone. So just, first of all, this was definitely a consideration in, in um, developing that minimum distance from the pipe to, to drinking water wells, um, as well as uh, measures that will be taken um, at either end of the, the tunneled section where the surface is, um, where the pipe and the drilling fluid within the, um, the, 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 um, the bore uh, will be close enough to the, to the surface where um, some breakout is possible. Um, so mitigation measures are being taken at either end to ensure that we don't have breakout of drilling fluid to the surface and, uh, and that the pipe is uh, far enough away from, from drinking water wells to, um, to mitigate any chance of, uh, of drilling fluids migrating over to, to contaminate those wells. I wonder if, um, if if Stephanie is on the line, if uh, she might want to add to that uh, answer. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, so I guess just to, I think just to reiterate what you said, there's kind of two uh, main aspects of the control. On the design side, uh, we select an alignment that provides that buffer um, so that we have that distance, that extra separation. Um, and from kind of a construction perspective, 
Uh, we, we, have, we closely monitor the drilling fluid um, as the drilling occurs to ensure that that slurry remains within the borehole. Um, and then um, if there are any uh, challenges there um, dur dur due to changing conditions in the ground, um, then the team is able to modify the, the mix that they're using for drilling fluid to um, adapt to the circumstances. Great. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. And I'm um, sorry I didn't uh, provide your full name. Stephanie Robillard works with um, Macmillan Jacobs, who are a subconsultant to uh, our uh, team at HDR. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, guys. So another question is about um, the HTP pipe and what the um, cost difference is between that and steel pipe. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, the relative difference between those two varies significantly as the price of pipe is quite volatile, but I think I'll hand you over to, to Walt Bayless at HDR to provide a little more detailed answer there. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's an interesting question. I think the first consideration is the suitability of the material over the actual cost of the material. Because this is a gravity flowing pipe, the use of steel is actually not a, a, a suitable and appropriate material. And in fact, the, uh, the regional district is, is having to invest in a premium to use HDPE. It's actually the uh, more robust, more, uh, it's actually gonna be a costlier material over the steel for this installation. Uh, and, and it's being done because of the suitability for the application. Whereas uh, the steel would be exposed to corrosion and due to the location and the operating under gravity flow is, is actually not an appropriate material. Great. Um, and then can there just be maybe some confirmation about um, any pressure testing that is done on the pipe before it is installed um, and how, how that um, testing is done? Walt, do you want to carry this one? Yeah, too? I figured so. Uh, so the pipe, when it's strung out, it's actually pressure tested multiple times. So it'll be strung out over land and then they will put flanges on either end and then pressure test it. The pressure rating for the piece of pipe is about 200 PSI. Uh, the operating needs are, are zero pressure. So we have the flexibility to take it up to quite a high pressure to look for leaks. So it is pre-tested at say about a four to six hour process to test it in advance of being installed. Once it's installed, it's then pressure tested a second time under similar conditions, again, a four hour to six hour pressure test. HDP is much longer than what you would see in normal water mains due to the material nature. So it's actually pressure tested on land then after it's installed. I'm gonna do another one from the Q&A and then I'm gonna switch over to a few that were submitted by email in advance. So the next question in the Q&A window is, what is the geological strata between the aquifer and the gravity fed pipe? Sure, yeah, thanks for that question. So we're fortunate to have Antonio Baruso and R.D. Poor on the line from GW Solutions. And GW has been involved in this project from the, um, from the get-go. Um, and they've done a, a lot of work to help model the, the strata within Lazo Hill. So I think I'll, I'll pass you over to R.D. Poor to uh, help answer this question. Uh, sure, thank you. Hi, uh, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, we have been working in the area. And so basically, uh, as you know, the aquifer is uh, aquifer 408, uh, which is an unconfined aquifer, uh, meaning that there is an unsaturated zone on top of it. And then there is the water surface. Uh, basically, the material is the same all over within the unsaturated zone where the pipe is going to be installed in. And then we have uh, about 10 meters below that uh, uh, water surface, which is the saturated zone of the aquifer. Great. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to a couple uh, questions that came in by email in advance. So there was a letter that came in um, specifically raising concerns about the handling of a sanitary leak at Hillside and Highland in September, 2021, um, which reached Brooklyn Creek. So this of course raises concern for the writer about potential harm to the aquifer and some reticence about the ability to correct a leak should one occur in this case. So kind of with that as the context, um, the question is how can a leak in a tunneled um, sewage conveyance line be isolated and repaired, um, you know, 
with that distance below surface without posing a risk to the quadra aquifer, uh, considering the length of time it took to correct the hillside and highland spill. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll take a first go at this and then maybe draw on, uh, lean on some of the advisors to help complete the response. So, um, so first of all, that, that the leak that uh, was mentioned in the letter, um, not in, involved in, intimately in the details, but I understand that was a leak from the town collection system at the surface um, and, that, uh, and that wastewater flowed, came out to the surface and flowed into the nearby creek. Um, so this, this, the circumstances are, are, are very different. Uh, you know, in, it, given a, a hypothetical leak uh, from this line, um, largely due to the, um, the ground conditions surrounding that pipe uh, that I already just touched on, um, you know, being highly dense and compacted um, sand under you know, significant pressure from the, um, the 20 to 30 meters of, of, uh, of material above. Um, so we're, um, G one, of the, one of the key pieces uh, or deliverables from GW was a memo, which will be made public next week along with the, um, the uh, agenda for the February 15th uh, Sewage Commission. Uh, and that memo, um, in that memo, uh, Artie and, and the GW team summarize um, their assessment of the kind of the travel time of wastewater leaking out of a hypothetical leak from this from this line, um, and, uh, and, and 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 kind of the key objective for that memo was to identify what that minimum distance from drinking water wells to this pipe would be, and as uh, as Russell um, intonated in his uh, presentation, um, that, that that value was set at twenty meters. Um, and uh, and Artie's conclusion, uh, Artie and the team's conclusion was that uh, that leaking wastewater from that pipe out of a hypothetical leak, in the very unlikely event that a leak were to occur, would take about 568 days uh, to travel from that uh, from that leak to the to a, to a well located at that minimum distance of 20 meters. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll just pass you over to Artie just to explain uh, it, you know, at a high level, because I believe me, there's a, there's a lot of uh, geotechnical uh, knowledge there that, that's behind that conclusion, but just at a high level, um, kind of some of the mechanisms that govern the rate of travel between uh, the, the hypothetical leak um, and either the, the groundwater below or, or a nearby well. Artie, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, Yes, uh, we have done a bunch of modeling and it's still ongoing, of course. Uh, we want to make sure that we refine the model and uh, come up with uh, uh, the most realistic answer. Um, so basically, as you, as Chris mentioned, uh, it's a very compacted sand, uh, the quadra sand. And we have two zones. We have the unsaturated zone and the saturated part of it. Uh, Basically, any leakage from, from the pipe, any potential leakage from the pipe would have to percolate through the unsaturated zone before it gets to the water table. Uh, we have done two different types of modeling uh, in the area, uh, given the, um, the characteristics of the aquifer that we have. And uh, yes, the range of the potential contamination to move within the saturated zone is about uh, between 300 to 900 days, which we have to refine that. Uh, and then within the unsaturated zone, uh, that's about uh, seven, 70 days to 100 days, which would be added to whatever time that it takes to in, within the unsaturated zone. Great. Thanks, Ardi. And maybe just one more one more piece to add to that response, um, and just you know, just to to flag again or reiterate the significance of this shift from from a pressurized main through this area to, to one with gravity flow inside. You know, as as has been highlighted, um, the, the 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 type of material, the, the wall thickness, is being driven um, by the installation and the, the need to meet seismic uh, standards regulations on this on this line. Um, and so this shift from pressure to gravity uh, uh, pressure within that pipe or gravity flow within that pipe has not translated to a decrease in the wall thickness or the robustness of that pipe. Um, and so you know while, while we while we were justifiably you know stating that the chance of a leak 
you know, prior to that shift was, was very, very low. This shift has, 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 has rendered a, a leak in this section extremely unlikely and, um, and not just reduced the likelihood of a leak, but in the event of a leak without that pressure inside the pipe pushing water out of a, a hypothetical leak, um, you know, it would be, it, it would be more of a steeping rather than, you know, than, than, than having any pressure behind it, which would, you know, significantly reduce the impact, not just the likelihood, but, but also the impact of, of a leak in that area. Great, thank you. And then just another question, I think we've covered another question that came in, in that letter, but the third and final was how, how would contaminated soil and water be removed from around a pipe in the instance of a unlikely hypothetical leak? Um, and how, is there an estimate about how long a repair would take? Sure, yeah, so I, I guess there's two pieces there. I mean, the, the, maybe I'll address the repair first of all, and, and then the second part about uh, removal of contaminated soil. Um, so one of the commitments made in the groundwater protection policy that Russell summarized um, in his presentation is, is to, to be prepared. So, so just to reiterate very briefly, you know, do everything we, we possibly can to design and build a pipe that won't leak. Um, undertake monitoring uh, both from groundwater as well as um, some type of acoustic uh, monitoring within the pipe at a, at a, at a uh, regular period to make sure that we pick up a leak as soon as one, you know, as soon after one occurs as possible. Um, and with that acoustic leak detection, that, that, that allows triangulation very precisely of, of where that acoustic signature of a leak would be generated. Um, and then once armed with that information, the third part of that, that groundwater protection policy is, is doing everything we can to be as prepared as possible to respond to a leak if, in the very unlikely event that one were to occur. And that could, that would involve um, you know, having shelf ready designs, uh, both for the repair methodology, having all required um, repair materials and equipment on, on hand in terms of um, sections of pipe, uh, repair saddles, et cetera. And then also having relationships you know, with uh, local contractors and, uh, and consultants in place uh, to, to streamline a response. All that to say that we would we would get to it as as, as quickly as possible. And then the repair itself um, would very likely be done. You know, once that triangulation of the of the leak is known, the repair would, would be would be done from the surface using a, um, a kind of a large diameter steel pipe sunk down, excavated out from the middle to provide access above that section of pipe so that it could be repaired. In terms of removal of contaminated material, um, certainly that repair methodology would, would allow um, removal of some of the material directly around the, the leak, um, but uh, you know, obviously a, a much much larger excavation would be required if we were to, to chase down all of the material that that, that, that escaped. However, I, I think I might uh, lean on Artie again to to just speak to some of the biological and chemical processes, biological, chemical, and mechanical filtration processes that are that would be happening within that highly compacted sand substrate around uh, the the hypothetical leak. And I think our sense from the study work that we've done and, and um, commissioned through GW is that, um, is that, that, that the ground would be effectively treating that water over time. But Artie, could you expand upon that? Uh, yes, of course, that's true. Uh, usually what happens uh, within the soil is that uh, when you have a chemical entering the soil uh, that we call it, whatever solute that it is basically, yes, it will uh, react with the soil particles. Um, and that portion we have not actually taken into account. Uh, that requires very uh, complicated uh, measurements and modeling. But uh, basically we have come up with a conservative approach, uh, but we know that there will be uh, chemical reactions between the, between the soil particles and the, uh, and the materials, uh, which basically uh, will uh, further slow down uh, the solutes within the soil before it reaches to the groundwater. Great to go. Thanks, Artie. I'm going to switch back to some of the questions in the Q&A uh, window now. So the first one is, what is the CBRD doing to um, make sure that the sensitive habitat of Lazo Marsh is protected um, during this project? Sure. 
Yes. So um, as Russell mentioned in his presentation, we've we've um, we've shifted firmly away from uh, horizontal directional drilling installation of a pipe under Lazo Marsh, given um, you know, assessment of the geotechnical results of the, the first geotechnical program that we undertook in the area that highlighted the artesian pressure of the, of the groundwater in that area. So we, we recognize the significant risks uh, inherent with both technical and um, you know, to, the, to the aquifer and, and, and to a lesser extent to the marsh itself of, of, of drilling through that, um, that, that artesian pressure aquifer. So we're very, we have our sites for, very firmly set on um, installation of the pipe by a cut and cover across that section of marsh. Um, so we, we, we fully recognize that that, that, that marsh is a, is a sensitive habitat. And uh, so we're working very closely with HDR and with our um, and environmental subs to develop, uh, uh, to, to assess options that, um, you know, that, uh, that, that keep that in mind and protect the, that, that sense of the habitat. So the, you know, for example, um, and, you know, as Russell mentioned, we haven't, we haven't settled on a, on a precise uh, solution yet, but you know, for example, the, the time of year that the installation would occur would be selected to minimize impact to occur while plants and and, uh, and and animals in that area are, are least active, um, <clears throat> and uh, to, therefore to, to minimize that that impact, uh, to minimize the, the width of the the cut across the marsh, um, and and potentially you know, likely incorporate some element of uh, risk, uh, uh, habitat enhancement. So not just restoration of the impacts from the um, installation of the pipe, but but incorporation of some type of habitat enhancement work as, a, as kind of paired with the project that would actually leave you know, the, the marsh in, in better condition than we found it. Just wanted to point out as well that um, that, that marsh does, does ex um, periodically get overgrown with, with vegetation and it's a, one of the management practices in that area is actually to bring in heavy equipment and scrape, um, you know, clear out some of that gathered veg vegetation, some of which is invasive um, and and, uh, and reintroduce some open water areas. So the marsh itself is not, you know, it's not a stranger to having heavy equipment in it. And then we are hopeful and we expect that uh, through this project that we, we can actually leave it in a better condition than we find it. Uh, the next question is about liability insurance by the CBRD. Is there any information that can be provided about limits or amounts that the, of liability insurance that the regional district carries that could maybe offer some comfort to residents who might be worried about the cost of damages incurred in the event of a pipe leak? Sure. Yeah. I, I... To be, to be frank, I don't I don't have a good grasp on the upper limit. I'm not aware of a limit, but what I can do is commit to um, unless somebody else, whether Russell or anybody on the line has a has a has a specific answer to that, we could commit to um, to posting a response as part of the follow up to the session. I would just say, and I don't think it's a complete answer. I think you're right, Chris will follow up, but uh, the regional district uses the municipal insurance uh, authority and it is a group insurance uh, provided to local governments that ensures that we have adequate coverage. There's specialists in local government coverage in terms of sewage, water, and other, other works that, that uh, municipalities and regional districts undertake. And certainly I think, you know, Chris has said it, right? This is extremely unlikely that a leak will take place. In fact, I think many jurisdictions would, would leave it at that. It is so remote that a leak would take place. That's our own reaction. But I really want to emphasize our, the importance for you to be able to sleep at night and for us to be responding to the concerns you raised. We're going that extra step by developing this policy to, to ensure that we are thinking about absolutely everything and we're not so conceited to think that we've got an answer to it all, that uh, we're taking every possible consideration into account to, to help you to sleep at night and feel confident that uh, we've got this project right. Chris, did you have something else to add? No, no, that's, that's, that's great. We will follow up though, with, a, with any specific limits to our liability coverage. Um, is this the final route at this point, or do you anticipate any further changes? So th this is the, this is the final route. Uh, so there's, there's just been a, an enormous amount of, of, of effort that's gone into, you know, at the CVRD and, and our advisors into, into finalizing this route. Um, and so there no further changes are expected. 
Can you share a bit of information, some more detailed information about the leak detection system? Um, explain kind of what this is, how the system is going to be used, and if there are examples of other jurisdictions that have used a system like that. Sure. Yeah. So the the technology that's um, that's um, being considered or included within the, the groundwater protection policy is is a form of acoustic leak detection. So it's actually a technology that we've used several times uh, successfully lo locally here, uh, both on the within the sewer system, but also on the on the water for the Comox Valley water system, the regional water supply system. Um, and so that technology um, really sends a highly sensitive um, acoustic listening device. So in the, in the case that the, the technology we use specifically was the smart ball technology. And it was about a softball sized piece of foam, very low density foam um, within which a, a highly sensitive acoustic um, sensor is inserted. And then that whole package is turned on. Um, and then there's, there's some um, sensors placed at intervals along the pipe that's to be tested to allow that triangulation that I mentioned earlier to, to allow um, the precise, uh, to develop a precise location um, of, of that ball at all times so that it can be combined with the graph of, of, of sounds that it, that it hears as it passes along the pipe. And then that pipe, that, uh, that, that sensor is introduced to the pipe and it flows with the, with the, the normal flow of, of wastewater or water within that pipe uh, through to the end point where it's captured it and withdrawn and the information is, is assessed. So that's the technology that's, um, that is likely to be used here. Um, we are looking at, at approximately a, a one year interval for, that, uh, for those inspections to occur. Um, and that we're, we're, we're kind of linking that closely with the results of, the, um, of the, the study work completed by GW Solutions regarding the travel times of wastewater to ensure that we're inspecting the pipe at a frequency that would allow us to pick up a leak um, and undertake a repair within the time, with, with, well within the expected travel time of that wastewater to any sensitive receptors ne nearby. Okay, in the Q&A uh, window, I'm going to just move through and try and make sure people who haven't had a chance to pose a question yet are able to put one forward. And so the next question is um, whether or not the construction plan would start on the Courtney side and move towards Point Homes or Point Homes and move towards Courtney. Yeah, sure. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask Walt to jump in to help uh, answer this one. Thanks, Chris. The specific construction plan, actually, the nature of the contract mechanism that's been selected by the regional district to use a design build actually affords flexibility around the construction plan. Specifically for the directional drill work, the arrangement is planned that they can start or finish from either the Lazo end or the Moreland Road end to afford that flexibility to optimize cost. The biggest fundamental driver is, is actually the pullback requirement. And that actually dictates that it would end by being pulled from the Moreland Road over to Lazo Road uh, direction. And the reason for that is to allow lay, back, lay down of the, the pipe through the wastewater site rather than through the town of Comox. I guess, uh, okay. Okay, and you. is, oops, sorry. And is there infrastructure being built at the terminus of Moreland Road? Do you want me to take that again, Chris? Sure, yeah. The, go ahead. Well, the, it, you're, it is true as we turn onto Moreland Road and head north, it, it continues to fall down slope and, and then turns again towards the marsh crossing and then back up into the wastewater site. Because of the use of, of the HDP, it is a pressure rated system, so it can, uh, so no infrastructure is needed there beyond the pipe itself. And so the next question is whether or not just trenching at Lazo Road is um, still a viable option. I think the question is, that it, would that actually be kind of less problematic than drilling under, um, under the hill there? So yeah, as I intonated in response to the earlier question, you know, no further changes to the alignment are, are expected, and certainly not a revisitation of uh, of cut and cover installation over Comox Hill, or Lazo Hill. Um, you know, the 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 primary, you know, by far the biggest driver for 
or cutting through the hill rather than up and over it is the, um, or the, the operational risks and, and costs associated with pumping wastewater up over such a high height of land. Um, so yeah, so no, no, uh, no, no plans to reconsider the use of HDD through this section um, because of the, the significant operational risks associated with pumping wastewater at such an elevated pressure. Yeah, I might, I might just add to Colleen that uh, imagine if, if the conveyance line were cut and covered in the roadways through Lazo Hill, it would be under such enormous pressure, it would be close to the surface in the event of a, of a leak, which would be, or, or the puncturing of that pipe, which is a far greater risk close to the surface because of people undertaking works and highways and whatnot. Mark described it best to me, there would be a geyser of sewage, a hundred feet in the air because of the extreme high pressures or otherwise. So it, if that were even a possibility, I don't think as a resident of Lazo, it would be preferable to have a high pressured main within the roadway surrounding your community because of the higher risk of an, an accident or an incident and the enormous impact of such an accident or impact. Okay. Um, and then we had a question about whether or not it would be harder to, to, to detect a slow seepage or a slow leak than a larger, um, higher pressure leak, basically. Um, and, and just some continued kind of seeking of, of assurance that we would know about any leak before people um, ended up with contaminated drinking water. Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. Um, so what I what we haven't touched on today is one of the implications of, um, of that shift to gravity flow through this area. So as I mentioned, the acoustic leak detection does require um, some pressure in the pipe to generate sufficient acoustic signature, you know, through the kind of the hissing noise of, of, of water escaping through a crack or a, or a pinhole. Um, so with that shift to, to gravity, that, that pressure would not normally be in that pipe, which is you know, what we're touting as, as such a, a big uh, improvement on, on this design in terms of you know, risk mitigation of a leak. So uh, Walt and his team have, have developed a solution that will allow us to temporarily pressurize that pipe just for the duration of an acoustic leak uh, um, inspection. And so that's through installation of a valve at the treatment plant location, they could back pressure that section raise the water level in that pipe up to the west end of that tunnel, which would be the highest point, to, to provide that pressure in the pipe. You know, the, the acoustic sensor would be, would be pushed, would be sent through under that pressure um, in order to, uh, to generate, you know, if there was a leak there, it, it, that would ensure that it would generate an acoustic signature that we picked up and triangulated. Um, so, so we're confident that, um, you know, regardless of the, of the size of a leak, even, even a small one, you know, that, that it would get picked up and uh, we could we could expedite uh, response to it. Um, the other the other the other um, element of, of monitoring or control we have here is the continued mon monitoring of the groundwater wells. So we've got nine wells in the area that we, we have a real time monitoring equipment on. Um, so they provide you know, a bit of a backup for to a certain extent for uh, for picking up of, of the, the kind of the chemical signatures of, of wastewater in the groundwater. But we're not leaning on on that, that on that measure. The the primary leak detection would, would certainly be the, the acoustic, um, with that groundwater as a, a as, as a backup. Can you clarify? Will the acoustic testing be continual or intermittent? Yeah, so definitely intermittent. So we're we're right now we're looking at a frequency of approximately one year. Um, so yeah, so sent through on an annual basis, and um, and as I highlighted, I, I drew that linkage earlier on in, in my responses here between between that frequency and the travel times that um, that have been highlighted by Artie and his team. Um, just keeping in mind that uh, you know in, in, in support of that minimum twenty meter distance, um, in, in reality, you know the vast majority of wells are, are significantly farther away from that. So we feel like we've got multiple layers of conservatism here. To ensure that uh, that 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 acoustic extent, that acoustic inspection is done on a frequency that would allow us to catch a leak well before it was even able to travel, you know, to the nearest point, assuming a leak happened at that point in the line where it is uh, adjacent to, uh, you know, at close to that minimum distance from the pipe to a drinking water well. Great. 
And what is the expected lifespan for the pipe? Maybe I'll, I'll pass this one over to Walt as well to speak to. Thanks, Chris. So the design right now is for out as far as the year 2100 for capacity. The actual material life is, is typically for HDP is, is around 80 years up towards 100. So, and because the actual pipe itself is designed for installation, not for operation. It's a factor of safety, which gives it a longer life as well, is uh, approximately a, a factor of safety of 10 on the operating condition. So uh, definitely it's being considered well past the year into the year 2100 and uh, affording CVRD a lot of opportunity to manage the infrastructure over that time. Great, thank you, Walt. Um, I'm just recognizing the time. It's it's one o'clock. We had set aside this hour uh, to be able to provide this update. Um, I know that the team can stick around for another 10 minutes or so to be able to work through some more questions because we do still have a few more in the Q&A window. Um, but I just want to recognize some people might have to drop off. And so for those who do have to leave us, thank you for being here with us for the hour. I um um, just sharing uh, an image with the website where additional information will be shared and how you can ask any other follow up questions afterwards so uh, just so that uh, those who have to leave can make note, um, make note of those addresses uh, before they go. So, but with a few more minutes I'm going to keep moving through the Q and a window with additional questions so. Um, the next one is uh, about the timeline for final decisions around the Lazo Marsh plan. Do we have an idea about when those options, solutions will be finalized? Chris? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure, of course. The question is about when, um, when we might have a final plan for the Lazo Marsh um, section. Yeah, so we're, we're, we are in the final stages of that assessment. Um, so we, we hope to have that finalized very quickly like within the next, certainly within the next four to six weeks. Uh, that being said, we are um, working through a, a permitting process with the provincial government to, to seek uh, tenure for that, uh, that, that crossing. Um, so that there's a bit of uncertainty regarding that timeline, but we are working towards having a um, statement of requirements for our request for proposal. For, so for the procurement process for the, the construction contract finalized by the end of March. So we are hoping to have that uh, nailed down before that document is released. We have a couple more questions about kind of the, why the decision over the cut and cover versus trenching, which I think we've covered off, but one of the kind of added pieces here was whether or not there were archeological impacts um, considered in that decision um, between um, trenching versus uh, drilling. So yeah, so we we have worked extensively with the Comox First Nation and um, and their archaeologist, Dr. Jesse Moore, uh, to assess um, the archaeological risk along the entire alignment. Um, and this this section from Torrance to to Moreland um, has been highlighted as having very very little archaeological risk, and, and actually beyond that, down Moreland and across across Lazo Marsh. Um, so yeah, archaeological concerns or mitigation was not a, was not a factor in selection of tunneling through this section. Um, we have, we have that's, not, that's certainly not the case for other sections of the alignment uh, where they have really played a, a, a significant role in determining the final alignment. But certainly a lot in Lazo Hill, um, yeah, not, not a factor, not a, not a large factor. See a couple of questions and it, uh, we also had one submitted in writing in, it, in advance about the decommissioning of the old force main. So can you give any information about what that will require um, and the process, process um, expected there? Sure, yeah, so we do have an assessment under, underway to, to, um, to, well, to identify decommissioning options. Um, and then assess them. So that's been done on a, on a separate time timeline to the conveyance project implementation. Our focus now is, is very much on, on getting this project underway and, and uh, expediting, you know, taking out taking out the section of Balmoral Bluffs Force Main fr from operation to resolve that environmental risk. Uh, we will be bringing forward at some point in the near future to the commission the results of that assessment into the decommissioning. 
Um, it's a complicated one. The, the answer is not necessarily to remove the pipe from the foreshore, um, given you know the, the reality that that would that would that would um, result in significant impacts to that intertidal zone. So we're, we're assessing other options for leaving decommissioning in place as well. Um, what is the diameter of the pipe, um, both the interior and exterior? Walt, do you want to uh, speak to this one? Yeah, the pipe itself has an outside diameter of 34 inches and an inside diameter of 29. So and the walls are three inches thick. Right. And then um, a final question about how precise, um, how precise is the location um, or directional control of the HDD process? So what is the greatest allowed deviation from design um, versus the actual drilled location? Sure, this is an excellent question for Stephanie to, uh, to answer. Stephanie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I know this is an excellent question. Um, so this is a really uh, accurate uh, approach. Um, and so there's a couple of different strategies they can use depending on what part of the alignment they're in, um, where they're closer to surface. There um, are methods that they can use um, at the ground surface to allow them um, to provide additional information and feedback in terms of where the position actually is. Um, and then in terms of um, you know, for, further along, um, they're using, they have guidance tools that allow them to confirm exactly where that bore is. Um, in terms of, you know, it's on the order of, um, you know, tens of centimeters as opposed to, we're not talking about meters of deviation. So this is a, a really accurate uh, technique. And a question that came in by email, is there asbestos in any of the pipe materials? Uh, so, so no, the short answer is no, there's no asbestos in, um, in either the existing pipe or the, or the newly, the one to be newly installed. Our, our water system does have some aging asbestos cement pipe, um, but uh, that's not, uh, not present in any of the materials being talk, talked about here. Um, and my apologies, I obviously misunderstood a question. And so I just asked for, I've been asked for uh, some clarification. So the question is, why was the decision to use cut and cover made at Comox Hill? And did that consider archaeological impacts? Um, and in addition to that, is there any discussion about pedest possible pedestrian enhancements that uh, could be incorporated um, as a result of that decision? Sure. So. Um... So just in order, so no, the uh, archeological concerns were not a, a driver for the shift from HDD to cut and cover on Comox Hill. Um, when, once um, Walt and his team were on board and had really sunk their teeth into, into the project, one of the, one of the kind of the kind of key pieces of due diligence was a revisitation of the hydraulic grade line analysis, just really understanding the, the pressures and heads at every part of that pipe. Um, and what we what we found with the help of that that kind of additional level of detail above what WSP had done previously was that there really wasn't much benefit to um, going that extra three or four meters of depth, uh, which is really what we were looking at doing through Comox Hill. Um, so we we undertook a life cycle assessment to to understand you know, what the impacts would be on pumping costs and 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 operational risk at the pump station of, of shifting to cut and cover. You know, from HDD through that section, and and um, it was a, it was it was a very easy decision to shift away from horizontal directional drilling there. As to whether there are um, opportunities for, for for any type of um, multimodal path in that area, I know that um, we are in the process of walking through um, kind of the, the the scope of of surface restoration and improvements through the town, you know, from from the the western boundary to the east, um, and I know that the town. Um, has at, at other areas been looking to to add bike lanes and that type of thing. So there is a prospect of that, but that has not yet been determined. Okay, I'm gonna just I uh, get some clarification about some of the comments. One comment that was made because I think it spoke to a couple of the comments that have been posted in the Q and A. And then I think this is going to be our last question as we um, close in on the ten minutes after one, and we are pretty well near the end of our list. So just for clarification about the leak detection sensor system, um, can you clarify that is that that 
would only go through once a year? And then is there, does that open up concern that it would just be a very delayed uh, detection of a leak as opposed to the maybe more obvious sign of a leak that could be found in um, a cut and cover or force main, um, a high pressure force main uh, scenario? So yeah, def definitely can confirm that uh, that would be a, an annual inspection. So just, just on that one time per year, the rest of the time, we will be looking at the groundwater monitoring, but also transient pressure monitoring, you know, when possible for that, for that pipe, you know, balancing, you know, looking at flows and pressures, which could provide some indication for a larger leak, but the smaller ones we would be leaning entirely on that periodic acoustic leak detection. While also, while also remaining um, you know, up to date on developments within that, uh, that sector, um, and certainly open to, um, you know, to, to, to installation of, of, of real-time technology if it becomes available in, in the future. Um, but as far as, you know, back to that difference between the, the cut and cover versus installation at depth, you know, as, as Russell mentioned, a higher likelihood of, of, of having a leak at a surface installation given the pressures and the vulnerability to, to, to to, to puncture, accidental puncture from you know, homeowners or contractors not checking with BC1, that type of thing. So much lower likelihood of a, of a, of a leak occurring at depth. And then because as we, as we touched on earlier on in the, in the responses, because of that, that highly dense nature of the ground at, at depth, the, and, uh, and the, the shift to gravity flow in that pipe, the, the propagation of, 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 of any leak would be, um, extremely slow you know, that, that uh, those hundreds of days that uh, that already had mentioned so that that report will be made public with the agenda for the sewage commission that will be coming out toward the end of next week i definitely encourage um the, the, the person asking this question any any other people on the call today to to take a look at that um at that study which i think you'll find very re reassuring and and colleen i'll just add that uh, nowhere in the system that we have proposed Will there be pressures, such as I described, that the pressures would be at the top of Lazo Hill if it were cut and cover? If we cut and cover over Lazo Hill, there would be enormous pressures on, on the system that we will not realize in what we have proposed for the entire conveyance route. Thank you, uh, Russell, for that clarification and Chris for that information. I think we are um, at the end of our time and are going to have to wrap it up at this point. I know there are a few questions we've committed to following up with additional information on. And if there's any questions we didn't get to, we will share further information in the coming days. I'm going to just reshare my screen with the wrap up slide that has information about the um, website address and email phone number if you have any further questions that you want to um, follow up uh, follow up on after our session. Um, I'll remind people again, we're doing this again tomorrow uh, at five o'clock. It'll be the same presentation and the same team here to answer questions. If you know of somebody who might be interested in the update, we you know encourage you to send along uh, the information. Uh, and this recording will also be posted to the connectcbrd.ca website. So, uh, uh, forward slash conveyance project. Uh, so that can also be shared or reviewed again in, um, in the future. So uh, with that, I want to say thank you, um, obviously to our panelists and to the presenters for all the information shared today, but also to all of uh, the residents that were able to give us their time. Uh, thank you for giving us a few extra minutes so that we could cover off as many questions as we were able to today. And uh, I hope you've had direct questions answered. Uh, we look forward to continuing to keep you uh, in the loop about this project as we move forward. So with that, um, thank you everybody for joining. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.